later on. Good morning. classes. Um, and for those who are watching at home or who will watch this later, we're so glad you're here as well. Let's start this morning with an affirmation. I am love, the very energy of life. Love is everlasting and limitless. Love flows to me and through me with every breath. I am love in action and humanity benefits from my expression. Okay, so as you can maybe guess or you looked at, we're talking about the book Eros, A Return to Unconditional Love by Don Miguel Ruiz and Barbara Emerus. Um, the front of the book looks like this. Um, I all of digital, so I don't have actual books to hold up. Um, so this book was is part of uh, a series that Don Miguel and Barbara did called Mystery School. And so the format, um, it looks like it was like a five-day lesson on each of these short little books and topics. And so this book is broken out into, uh, you know, day one, this is what they were talking about, day two, and so on. So Don Miguel and Barbara use Eros, the story of Eros, to illustrate our journey of coming to being, coming into love, um, being in our humanness, and then returning to unconditional love. So I had to look up the full story of Eros because I didn't know that. And they just kind of give little snippets throughout the book. And so what I found was this. The story of Eros is that he was a character from ancient mythology. In Greek sources, he was called Eros, the god of love. And in some early texts, he was one of the original gods, but then as mythology goes and stories get told later on, um, he became the son of Aphrodite and Ares. <clears throat> and in Roman depictions, he is known as Cupid. So we're probably more familiar with this imagery of a Cupid running around shooting arrows at people and making them fall in love. And so what's interesting is the story of Eros. In the earlier stories, it seems that Eros was created or was to, uh, intended to be the expression of authentic love. And he used his arrows to bring people together and spread love throughout the world. Now, as the stories grew about Eros, there became these other themes about um, people, humans, or gods asking Eros to create matches that would benefit them in some way, or sometimes to make poor matches as a way to punish someone or keep someone small. Um, if the gods thought that someone was getting too much attention, they might ask Eros to make them fall in love with someone that would kind of pull them down a little bit and make them remember their humanness instead of, um, you know, them feeling as if they were equal to the gods. And so um, those stories about Eros and Cupid are about creating, just creating chaos for humans and gods alike and starting to use love as a tool for jealousy, revenge, entertainment, control, all of those things. Um, they also, the stories start to explain that Eros at some point realizes that he's immune to his own arrows and people um, that there's no, he can't make anyone else fall in love with him either. So he is almost separate from this love that he is sent out to create in the world. <clears throat> and so he can't find love for himself and he gets very lonely and disillusioned. And so even more chaos um, comes into the stories 
um, as he feels more separate from love, he kind of loses his way and, and maybe forgets what he's supposed to be doing with his love arrows and his abilities. At some point, his mother, Aphrodite, becomes jealous of a human named Psyche, who was very beautiful and she was getting far too much attention. Humans were paying her much attention. Um, men were almost worshiping her as a goddess and Aphrodite becomes jealous. So she goes to Eros and she says, um, I want you to shoot her with an arrow and make her fall in love with the ugliest creature you can find. And this was a way of making her small. She wanted to um, punish her for being so beautiful and amazing and tie her to something that people would um, you know, start to question her beauty or her, um, her beingness. Instead, as these old stories go, Eros goes to do this task that his mother has set him out to do, but he also finds himself very drawn to Psyche. And it's interesting, Psyche in um, the old translation like literally translates to soul. Um, so he goes and he starts to fall in love with Psyche, but he knows again that he can't use his arrows to make her fall in love with him. And so he hides her away from his mother so that she can't do any damage to her. And he takes her to his, one of his homes that is beautiful. He's got a, you know, it's a luxurious environment. Um, there's riches and a castle and just a beautiful place that they're hanging out. But he so believes that she can't fall in love with him and that she would not be able to see value in him that he keeps himself invisible. So she knows he's there. She knows he's protecting her, um, but he's invisible to her and she can only hear his voice and hear his guidance. Um, and over time, she begins to fall in love with him even though she's never seen him. Well, all is going fine until Psyche's sisters come to visit. And they become jealous of this luxurious environment that she's living in and all of the, the riches that she has access to. And she's talking about Eros and how he cares for her and how, this beautiful relationship they have. And they're very jealous of this. And so they convince her that he must be either truly hideous, he's an actual monster, and that's why she, he won't let her see him, or that this is all part of some elaborate trick to trap her um, into this life. And she starts to doubt his affection for her. She starts to doubt why he's taking care of her. And so in some way, she ends up betraying him, and he's so disappointed by this um, and it confirms everything that he's thought that she could never love him all the all the stories he had told himself he becomes so disillusioned he he leaves her and leaves her alone in this place well she of course then realizes when he's gone that she let her sisters influence her and think things that were not true and that she really did love Eros and he really did care for her and it was evident in all of the actions and the interactions that they had had together. So who does she go to for help but Aphrodite? <laughs> um, because she doesn't know that the whole reason Eros spirited her away is because Aphrodite was trying to make her small. So she goes to Aphrodite for help. And Aphrodite is still jealous of her, but doesn't want her to know that. And so she tells Psyche that she will assist her only if she can complete a series of tasks to prove her love for her son. And of course, these tasks, as the Greek gods were prone to do at times, these tasks are things that were not really humanly possible. Um, things like visiting the underworld and, and getting something, you would have to die to do that. And, and so Psyche is very um, distraught, but, as, but she decides that she would far rather try the tasks than to sit and do nothing. And so she starts trying to do the tasks. And what happens is Eros by this time has realized as well that he truly does love Psyche and that even if she can't return his love, he wants the best for her. 
and he wants her to be safe. So he returns to her in secret, and he begins to guide her along the path. And in the tasks, the parts that aren't humanly possible, he lends some of his um, God abilities, and he employs help from other individuals to get her through these tasks safely. And so the end of the story is that she does get through the tasks safely with Eros' help and, and his intervention and guidance. Um, she, at the end, realizes that he was there all along, guiding her through. And at the end of the story, because she's completed all of the tasks and they had kind of a binding agreement, Aphrodite ends up having no choice but to acknowledge their love. And she makes Psyche immortal so that they can spend eternity together. So that's the story of Eros. Um, so Don Miguel and Barbara use that as the story of you and me and the story of humanity and how we come into this world. Um, and so here's what they say. Once we were perfect reflections of love, and then we became seduced by a particular kind of story. The story of Eros eventually became a story about our need to conquer anything that is valued by other people. It highlighted our desire to possess, to capture, and to control. And somehow, love became a fight for attention. Attracting love became the only indication of our worth. And so they talk about how, you know, when we're born as infants, we are born into this authentic expression of love. And we don't differentiate our bodies from the rest of the universe. We are just happily um, a part of this humanness as well as connected to, um, you know, divine and, and all of those things. They say labels don't matter because we don't have language yet. So as an infant, it doesn't matter the words people are saying around you until you can understand that language. It doesn't influence um, much of what you're doing because you just, you're still feeling that connection. Um, and then slowly, we increase our skills of processing information and language. And that's the point where other people's knowledge and behavior begins to shape our thoughts and behavior. And so we start to learn to label things in the way of our caregivers. And we learn good and bad, <laughs> right and wrong. We learn who to trust, who to be afraid of, even who to love and who to hate. And, you know, they talk about that this is programming that's passed on from generation to generation. And it's not that anyone is intentionally trying to um, create problems for us. It's just that, you know, we all come in and we have our human experience and then we start projecting that out to those around us. And that becomes the story that we live by. And um, so what it's really teaching us is that there are conditions to love, right? And so depending on what part of the country you grew up in, what family you grew up in, what neighborhood, all of those different factors, uh, you really start to learn that certain thoughts, beliefs, and behaviors will be rewarded with love and others will not. And so we start to shape our behavior. We try to fit into that mold. And when we do that, as we know here at Unity, we start to put those same conditions on those around us because that's what seems normal to us. That's, that's the story that we've bought into and what um, is shaping our behavior. So they talk about that these conditions, you might be familiar with things that sound like um, I'll love you as long as you love me back. I'll love you forever as long as my feelings don't get hurt or you follow my rules or you let me be in control. <laughs> have, you, have you ever felt any of those from those around you or felt yourself putting those conditions on others? Um, it also shows up as us being resentful when we feel like we're giving more love than we're receiving. Um, we start keeping mental account of who is giving how much and who they're giving it to. And, um, is this person getting more than me? And that and keep this little scoreboard in our head of who's getting love and, and when we feel like it wasn't given to us enough. Uh, we start to use love as a bargaining tool, as leverage or punishment by withholding 
uh, withholding our love from others until behavior matches our expectations. Oh, yep. I'm not coming through loudly, I guess, <laughs> in, the, in the screen, so. I can turn it up the stage okay. too. Okay, I don't enjoy this mic right in my face, but it is what is necessary. So we got to be real close to that one. Yes, we are getting a, an ear mic. It's just stuck on a boat somewhere. It's what we keep saying. It's one of those things that's been back ordered and we're having a hard time. Um, Sue's finally arrived, but the one for in here has not yet. <clears throat> so thank you, Sue, for letting me know you couldn't hear. Um, so what they talk about is that when we're using love as that bargaining tool, leverage or punishment, withholding until behavior matches our expectations, that is one of the ways that we harm those around us unintentionally. But it's also then, again, as we know in unity, that's how we're treating ourselves too, or we wouldn't be projecting that out in, you know, to the world. And all of these things they talk about are done in the name of love. And we talk about love, we have all these stories about love and contexts of love that really, when you break down some of the, the stories that maybe you believed about love, if you really look at them closely, you start to see the conditions that are built in to some of those stories. <clears throat> so as we grow, we start to gain skills of reason and if we use those reasoning skills and stay present to our thoughts and the actions that they're creating, we begin to find our way back to unconditional love. And so that's how they keep talking throughout this book about the story of Eros, that he comes in as this expression, he was intended to be the expression of love and to spread that unconditional love through the land. But as he starts to feel separate from love and outside influences are coming in and, and convincing him to do, um, you know, make these matches for different reasons, he just gets farther and farther away from who he was intended to be it gets lonelier and more separate um, and it's psyche which again if you remember that translation is the soul when he falls in love with psyche he begins to remember um, this idea of unconditional love and then of course there's still that drama of something else happening and he kind of goes separate again for a minute but he's much faster to remember that he um, wants to be unconditional love and to go back and support her. And then once they are truly bonded and have had that, both have that realization, then they get to live together throughout eternity in all happiness. So <clears throat> they talk about how it takes courage to change our own belief system and suggest reminding ourselves, uh, I don't have to believe what I think or I don't have to believe what everyone else thinks. And that can be um, the catalyst to really digging into how are you feeling about love? How are you showing up as love? And are you putting conditions on yourself that you are then um, you know, putting out to the world onto others as well? And that the journey is really about being present to the thoughts and the beliefs that you have about your own worthiness of love. And as you are reminded that you are divine love and can love yourself unconditionally, that same energy will flow from you and out into the world. And that's where you have a profound effect on those around you and humanity in general. And that's, you know, we talk about that a lot at Unity, being that divine expression of love and how um, that is where you truly have the power to change the universe and change your reality is by loving yourself unconditionally and allowing that to flow out. So Don Miguel also refers in the text to our belief system as a fortress. And he says, you know, you don't have to demolish the whole fortress. If you realize, oh, I have some really interesting thoughts about love, or I've been putting a lot of conditions on the love for, of myself and in my life, you don't have to tear the whole thing down. He says, just dismantle sections one thought at a time and discard the stories that are no longer needed, make new agreements with yourself and build up 
new and um, better parts of that fortress. And that each day we can move closer to truth by listening to our thoughts and questioning their authenticity, challenging old stories that no longer ring true. And as you start to judge yourself less and recognize your own authenticity growing, that's where real change starts to happen. And I know looking around this room, I've heard some of you tell your stories before, so I know that that's been true for so many that um, as you really start to dig in and look at that authenticity, am I showing, how am I showing up and do these beliefs that I've held um, ring true anymore? Are they serving me? Um, but that's where we've seen some real change happen within, within ourselves, within unity. And so things that will happen there is we feel more relaxed and in the flow of life. We respond differently to day-to-day -day situations. We start to judge ourselves less, judge others less. And in turn, we love more abundantly and we receive love more abundantly. So this book, um, as it goes through the different sections, it uses stories and myths to discuss each stage from birth to that return to unconditional love. And some are actual stories or they're, they've been tweaked, I think, to, to go in here. Some are um, stories that Don Miguel and Barbara created to illustrate, and they wrote them in kind of that um, you know, mythological style or, or just kind of that parable, whatever you want to call that. Um, and so what I thought would be interesting, because I know I was hoping that you all would show up, and I'm so glad you did, because I know that this room is full of some amazing metaphysicians, and we have some amazing ideas that flow through um, the people in this room. And so what I want to do is share the stories from each section and then have some discussion about what you hear in that story or what that um, maybe makes you think about in your own journey or whatever. So the first one is the story. So this is kind of the beginning story. <coughs> so long, long ago, there was only darkness. Suddenly, out of the belly of darkness, a goddess emerged. She was a winged being of unimaginable power and brilliance, and her name was love. Love scattered her power into countless millions of fiery stars. From the fires of every star, children were born. As creation grew and expanded, love's children lost the ability to recognize their own perfection. They turned against their mother, they turned against each other. In time, they betrayed their own offspring, allowing them to be devoured by the lies. This led to wars, and wars led to bloodshed and destruction. The pure power of the goddess, once represented in the brilliance of the stars, was weakened and made corrupt by these lies. And those lies live within her children until the end of time. So, thoughts about that? story. Does it ring true for anyone? Um, I think it, what it brought to mind for me was a couple of things. One was like a parable of um, our own reflection of our history as a human race. It also brought to mind Abraham, you know, populating the the land, the earth, maybe, you know, an, an offshoot of that. And, and I also couldn't help but think of the image when you were speaking was of Aphrodite, or no, not Aphrodite, Venus emerging from the waves. Um, it, it, boy, it kind of makes your mind go in a hundred different directions. Yeah. And so interesting that you bring up Venus because this is something, and I, you know, I'm at one point early in my education, I had studied some myth mythology, but then had kind of forgotten a lot. And so in reading this, so Aphrodite is the Greek term 
for that goddess, but Venus is the Roman term, and the stories are, it's pretty much the same stories, it's just the Greeks called her Aphrodite and the Romans called her Venus. So. Yeah, it's kind of amazing how, uh, as humans, we take uh, and have to explain. So we go back to this very early time in history where uh, adults are sitting around the campfire and children ask uh, about their feelings, one of which is love. But they also want to know why we are fighting. Why are there wars and things going on around us? And we use stories like this to... To, to show that not only do we, uh, so our children would be able to grow up and understand what their feelings are, but we also had to create dualism. A fact that if we have love, which we want you to understand, is we have to throw out, well, let's talk about war too, and why you get mad or angry. And I love how uh, they brought that into this story of dualism. Mm -hmm. Is it not an example of us being blinded by our own perception? Yeah. And then, you know, like they said, and it talks about that, um, you know, so the part of, and those lies will live within her children until the end of time. That's the part that Don Miguel and Barbara were talking about, that generation to generation, it's not that anyone is, um, is bad or trying to keep people from love, but it's those stories and those beliefs that just keep perpetuating um, until someone fully wakes up and then maybe they are the ones that teach the next generation um, in their tribe or family or, or whatever um, that you can look at love differently. And so, but when we know that once those things get started, I think the reason it says that we'll live within her children until the end of time is it's really hard to get everyone back on the same page, right? <laughs> so there's always going to be a pocket somewhere um, that has a different idea. It's a shame to me that, that uh, this is not included in the story because they lived unhappily ever after doesn't really set the first of me. Uh, <laughs> It's a, it doesn't seem to be, the story itself doesn't seem to be uh, reflective of reality at all, because okay. I don't believe in unhappiness ever after. And I think that maybe this story was intended to be a tool to make us feel exactly like that, that I don't want that to be the end of the story. Why does it have to be the end Shouldn't of the story that it will, those lies will live uh, within her children until the end of time. And so maybe this story was a little bit of a, a prod in the direction of, um, you know, how can I create a reality where that's not the continue, the perpetuation of the story, that's not at the end. So thank you, Dar. And it's, it's kind of like, as human beings, we, we know what love is because they started saying, well, uh, love was, uh, and she was all a star, so, and, and then we grew away from it. So we have an idea of what, of how things should be and what love is. It's not like we're oblivious to it, but like you said, it's how do you get back there? Yeah. So. And so <clears throat> the next section, we'll, we'll move on to the next story because I want to get to all of them. Um, and then we can keep discussing. So the next section is called Innocence, or the story of you. And so this is kind of us in that innocence stage um, and, and how um, the message we may be getting from divine mind before we have all of those influences coming into our world. And so it just, this is a story that might be told from divine mind. My child... You are the creative force of life made into flesh. You arrived into a world that already existed within a community of people that can be called a tribe. The ones who raised you were members of this tribe, and they spoke in its language. They practiced its ancient traditions. Your survival depended on obeying their tribal rules. First, it was necessary that you master your own physical body. 
As you became strong enough to stand and to walk, you also learned the language of your people. You joined their conversations and became clever in their eyes. You accepted their wisdom as true and virtuous. Through the years, every challenge they set for you was met, every mystery unveiled. This is how you learned to be a human in the ways of your tribe. This is your origin story, a story that cannot do justice to the amazing mystery that is you. So that is the part um, talking about how we come into that. And it's not, again, in our innocence of wanting to be part of the community that we're brought into and, and we want to, um, you know, we want that love from our caregivers and those around us that we kind of start to assimilate, right? To um, the customs of where we're from or our family. Anyone have any thoughts about that one? Yeah, I can't help, but that story brings to mind how the innocence is corrupted. It's taken advantage of, of those, those entities in, within the society and are, I can't help but frame almost everything in my life now around the imminent climate change disasters and catastrophes that are going to happen unless we change, we as a human race, change what we're doing. Um, I don't, you know, on the one hand, I can think of, oh, it's wonderful for, for example, a Native American child went before the, before the Europeans came to assimilate into that society. But then I think of the European child who was assimilating into an imperialistic society that wanted to control and, and capture more lands and subject more people and annihilate more people, let's be blunt. So it brings a lot. I feel very conflicted about that story. Okay. Hang on. So I came to Springfield originally and took an avatar course, and then I moved back, and Susan invited me to Unity. Um, and when I took the Avatar course, I went into what I later found out from a Unity book was chemicalization, which is eliminating your past. Um, the guy that did the Avatar course spent six weeks in a deformation tank eliminating his memory. And when he came out of it, he just was. And his wife comes home and he says, Amra, I am. Well, that's kind of what the course, it, it, there's a book called Resurfacing that helps you to resurface to who you are. And it, you look at, it's a workbook, you look at your beliefs and you look at why you have them and you look at who you care about knowing anything about yourself and, and that kind of thing. So it just, it just helps you to get back to your core Mm -hmm. and to, uh, to look at those beliefs and where they came from and why they came. Well, I just created so much that I was like kind of nowhere. And I didn't know who to trust. I didn't know who to believe because everything, my whole world had just been disintegrated. And that takes you back to that core person. And then you get to choose and I started going to an Abraham class when Terry was teaching it and I began listening and they never contradicted themselves no matter what question they were asked they never contradicted themselves and so I began to rebuild my world and unity was a part of that I still had a lot of stuff in my in my space when when Sue would say Jesus, I would be like, no, he wasn't who he's, you know, he was not God. He was not the bow down to person. But that's kind of where we're going here. I read a Leo Bastali book about, he taught a class at, at um, L, um, LA State or whatever it is. And he, it was on love. 
And what he did was he just asked everybody in the class, what is your idea of love? And then they shared. And everybody had a different viewpoint. But as they shared, oh, yeah, I could see that that could be love. I could see that your beliefs could be love. I could see that your beliefs could be love. And so it began to, to put that all into focus. And I think that when we, we realize where our beliefs come from, then we have the choice. But going through something that, that makes you look at that is, is just an incredible experience. Thank you. I loved mythology when I was a kid and read a lot of it and, and that. And one of the ideas in mythology or in uh, in the myths that are told about our existence is oh, is there's two ways to think about them. One is you can think about them where it's telling what went wrong and how somebody went wrong, how someone deviated from their true nature, and then either didn't find their way back because they deviated too far, or they did find their way back. But my preface is to think about it as um, this journey here, uh, we all go through many things that are very similar. The mythologies just talk about it. They're stories of how we're similar. And that we begin to see mythology not as mis um, mistakes made and that, but rather just as part of the journey. There's a book, there's a series of books called He, She, and We. And in there, um, one of the things was in, it talked about as part of our journey sometimes is the waiting and sorting. The waiting and sorting. And it's not that we want, we should avoid those, whatever part of the journey, but we begin to see it as part of the journey and part of the reason that we're here and that it's all good, then when we get to that sitting and waiting and sorting place, we can appreciate that aspect of it, or whatever aspect. Mm -hmm. All of us sometimes have to go through the hero part and experience hero. And sometimes we have to experience being the bad guy, whatever. It's all part of our story. Yeah, and so it made me think, if you've been, um, part of a child's life, part of, um, you know, raising a child, teaching a child. Have you ever heard, had a child reflect back to you a lesson that you unintentionally taught them about the world or about love? And have you ever had that moment where you just have to take a breath and pause and go, oh my goodness, I created that belief I didn't, I don't, that's not how I want you to look at the world. That's not how I hope you see the world. Um, but like we, so I think that's this part of it is like we do that unintentionally and hopefully if it's something that we didn't intend and it's reflected back to us, that's where we go, oh, wait a minute, what belief led me to say, to teach that in that way or um, to be showing up in that way that this is how now this uh, you know new child is thinking about love and experiencing love or, or just life in general. So the next part of the story is doubt, um, where we begin to doubt the ways of the tribe, that, so to speak, that we've been taught. And so here is the doubt story. <clears throat> Once there was a boy who believed he was nothing. He was so certain of this that he convinced everyone else that he was nothing. In time, he became almost invisible to those around him. Even his family seemed hardly to notice that he was there, and they rarely mentioned his name. One day, the boy was sitting alone on a cliffside, and a stranger walked by. He took one look at the boy and stopped. Approaching the boy, he asked, Who are you? I am nothing, the boy answered. Really, said the stranger. Stepping closer and looking deeply, he added, No, that can't be right. You are definitely something. And the stranger walked away. The man's words lingered in the boy's mind for days. He began to play with the idea that he was actually something. His attitude about himself began to change. He started to talk to people and to express his feelings 
His neighbors began to notice him again, and so did his family. The boy who thought he was nothing soon became convinced that he was something, and everyone else seemed to agree. As the boy matured, he became a popular personality in the community. He ran for mayor of his little town and won. He married the daughter of an important businessman, and they raised a family of their own. It mattered very much to him that everyone knew he was something. One sunny morning, the same boy, now an older man, met a stranger in the street who looked very familiar. The stranger stopped and looked at him and said, pardon me, sir, who are you? The town's mayor answered, why, I am something, of course. Really, said the stranger, stepping closer and looking deeply. No, no, it's clear to me that you are something else. And then the stranger walked away. Everything changed for the mayor on that day. He began to look inward and he realized that he did not know what he was. In fact, he had never known what he was. There came a time when he no longer felt the need to know. He spent his days taking solitary strolls throughout town. He often checked in on his neighbors and concerned himself with their needs. He didn't worry about what people thought of him anymore. He was beloved by many, but he remained a complete mystery, even to himself. Wow. That one gives me goosebumps. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. To, to read that. Um, and they talk in the you know the book that sometimes it takes that um, that perspective of someone who doesn't know the stories you've been told or the beliefs that you hold um, to just make one plant one little seed of doubt about those beliefs and stories. And then our mind grabs onto that and starts to think, well, what if that could be true? Um, anyone, did that, did I see a hand back or no? Oh. Uh, I couldn't help but think about um, that story really, really um, made me harken back to this just on the way here. I was listening to NPR and um, per, a former congressman from, I think, South Carolina, Bob Inglis, was being interviewed. He uh, ignominiously <laughs> lost 29% is all the vote he got after being in, con in Congress for 12 years, and that opponent got 71%, which that never happens, uh, due to the fact that he was approached by a stranger, apparently, that pricked his conscience about climate change. And he went down to Antarctica and saw the effect in person and reversed himself. He did. He totally, as anyone knows, I don't like to bring politics into this, but anyone knows about, that reads a newspaper, knows that, that his, he was a Republican. His party does not subscribe to the fact that there even is a, such a thing. Most of them don't. And he became uh, basically a pariah in his own city, and, or his own state, I should say. And, and yet he stuck to, you know, he was talking about the, the beautiful result in his own, within his own psyche of admitting that what, instead of just being a blind follower, standing out and being flexible. The, that was the whole per the whole subject of the TED hour this morning is being flexible in your thinking, and unfortunately, a lot of us don't like that. We don't. We like the the rigidity of our thinking. We like to it becomes things to be the same. Right? Yes. Yeah. Exactly we start right. to get comfortable in those beliefs, and um, and then we only look for information that strengthens the beliefs until something jars us to go, oh, wait, maybe. Um, for me, that makes me think, like, for how many of us is that the story of coming to unity? Of, of walking in and, and feeling like we knew, you know, we have this belief system and then something is said and we go, oh, maybe I am divine. <laughs> maybe I am connected to divine mind. Maybe this, I have access to all of this all of the time. What if that was true? 
Um, How empowering to be something else. Oh. That, out of uh, the stories I've heard so far, that's, this is the one that really sticks to me. Good. The aspect of that story that has the most meaning for me is when the stranger comes the first time, he doesn't say you are something else. He says you are something. And that there is a time in our journey when the message tells us, that t gives us a message. So like at one time, uh, when I lived in Utah, I was really, really active in uh, the, the poverty conferences and going in and trying to solve things from a political point of view and, and doing all those kinds of things because the information that I had about what we needed to change, particularly in mental health and a lot of things like that, uh, it spurred me to take certain actions and to live a certain kind of life. But then as you go along and you do all those things, then the day comes and you get, this is pre-metaphysics and everything, and then I get the stranger with, then gives a new message of metaphysics, you know, how do you stop the perpetrator without becoming the perpetrator? That was my message. And when it comes to this, it doesn't work if he still tried to be, instead of going mayor now with this new information, now I'm something else, means I'm going to be president. <laughs> instead, he realized that that meant moving into a whole new arena. And it's the same thing, like for me, was I move into the marina, uh, a whole new arena of metaphysics. I know that I am not going to change the world by becoming a higher political advocate. It's not necessarily, it could be someone else's journey, it could be some people could be in there. But I recognize that I changed the world from within. And so it's a different thing now. Just like this guy, it's a whole different way and a different approach to how you get things done <laughs> and what's important. Ah, oh, that's not, this is exactly the conversation I was hoping for. You guys are amazing. Um, so the next story is redemption. Long, long ago, there was a stag living in a beautiful forest. Magic flowed from his great heart and pulsed through the forest to every animal, blossom, and bird. The trees grew tall and thrived under his care. There was balance and harmony within, he, for he shared the power of life with every living thing. Close to the edge of this forest, there lived a young woman. She was clever and strong, and she had always been happy but a desire for power had begun to possess her. She spent her days searching for the great stag whose magic was known everywhere. She passed her nights dreaming of a time when she might capture him and be touched by his power. Her obsession grew so strong that it diminished her happiness. In her anguish, she built a strong shed and covered it with a roof of wooden, woven, woven branches and placed a heavy oak door at its entrance. Each morning, she laid fresh delicacies of grain and berries within the shed, hoping that the keen stag would be lured inside. And one warm summer evening, her efforts were rewarded. Returning home, she saw the stag standing inside her shed. He seemed undisturbed by her presence. He lifted his noble head and with a sweep of his antlers, acknowledged her. Then he went back to eating the grain that she had left. Breathlessly, she crept toward him and shut the door. She slid the bolts and stepped back. He was hers. His magic was hers to keep. She would be the most admired woman in the land. The majestic stag remained in his prison throughout the autumn months. He was fed well and he suffered no discomfort. He demanded nothing, nor did he attempt to leave. With one kick or leap, he could have been free, but he did not resist his captor. As time passed, however, the forest grew dark and gloomy. Trees, animals, and birds became apprehensive. Their music, once so lively, fell quiet. As winter approached, the girl, too, became solemn. The magnificent deer she once admired no longer ruled the woods or ran proudly over the gleaming hills. He was no longer elusive or mysterious. Possessing him had brought her no joy. One spring day, the young woman rose from her bed and walked to the shed. 
Gazing at the stag, she could see clearly what she had done. The prize that she had cherished was not the prize that she had won, and she wept at the sight of him. While he was free, he had been everything she wanted and loved. She had taken the splendor from her own life by stealing his. Her selfish heart began to open with love. Tearfully, she lifted the bolt and swung the door open. In one magnificent leap, the stag broke through the morning mist and bounded toward the forest. Almost as suddenly, the sun pierced through the mist and flooded the world. Jaybirds began to sing and warm winds stirred the willow branches. Squirrels chattered merrily again and hummingbirds darted through the open shed, making it seem pointless and small. The young woman smiled through her tears. She too had been small. She had been selfish and her desperation for power had made her blind to the truth. Obsession had spoiled her joyous wonder and her instinct to love. In the end, the stag's patience had been rewarded with compassion and love. By giving him back to the forest, the woman had earned his respect and the respect of countless other creatures. Their gratitude led to great generosity and the forest provided for her and protect her until the end of her days. Wow. So this they talk about, you know, sometimes the thing that we think will make us happy, um, we put so much weight on if I just have the love of this one person, if I just have this one thing. Um, but in our humanness, when we get to that, we tend to want to put it in the shed, right? Lock it up and, and keep it for ourselves um, and may not realize that in that act of possession, um, we are taking away the beauty of what it was that we looked for. And so they really talk about this about like in relation, real relationships with people, um, pursuing someone that you think is, you know, what you want. And if, oh, if I could just have the love of this person or if I could really possess this person, I would, I would really be um, happy. Um, but then in that relationship, putting the conditions on love and creating a situation where that person that we saw that was so wonderful, we start to chip away um, or lock away the parts of them that drew us to them in the beginning, or we, we shield them from the rest of the world, and um, it really throws off that dynamic. And so um, that story is, is about that. I'm gonna go ahead and move on to Total Surrender. That's the last story, and I'm looking at time. And then we can kind of discuss, um, well, I say it's the last story. There's one final statement of love. Um, so total surrender. There once was a captain, a very important military man, who was sent on an expedition to a faraway land with a small party of soldiers. There, in a remote jungle, he and his soldiers were caught in a violent tropical storm and separated from each other. After the storm had passed, the man found himself very much alone in the wild. As brave as he was, the captain was unable to cope with the dangers he faced in the jungle. After a few days, he was bruised and exhausted. He'd been bitten by insects and stalked by wild animals until he was too panicked to move from a small crevice among some rocks. He was discovered there by an old woman who helped him stagger to the shelter of her home. As it happens, this woman was the wife of a great shaman. The couple lived alone in a quiet clearing in the jungle. They took care of the captain and calmed his fever. They treated him with potions until he felt strong again. During his recovery, he watched them at work. He became fascinated by their skills, the way the old man could heal the dying and how he seemed to bend nature to his will. The captain asked the shaman to share the secret of his magical powers with him. He wanted to be the old man's apprentice. The shaman considered the idea for a while and finally asked the captain if he was certain that this is what he wanted. The captain replied, of course, yes, I'm certain. After a few days, the shaman asked him again, is this truly what you want? The captain again said yes. When asked a third time, he seemed more certain than ever. Yes, 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 I say again, yes. And so his apprenticeship began. The captain was taught to gather and prepare plants for tinctures. He carved weapons for hunting and forged tools. 
He served his teacher diligently. He hunted for them, shaman and his wife, and prepared their meals. The man had learned to be disciplined in the military, but after months of hard labor, he was exhausted and he was impatient. To the captain, it seemed that the shaman had shared nothing of his power and wisdom. So armed with a knife and some medicines, he left the couple, hoping to find his troop and resume his mission. But he never found his way out of that vast jungle. He traveled for days and weeks until he realized he'd been traveling in circles. With a growing panic, he moved faster, running through the brush and swimming recklessly across rivers and steam, streams. Even so, as he began to recognize familiar landmarks, he eventually saw that he had circled all the way back to where he had started. Beaten and frail, the poor man stumbled into the shaman's hunt, hut one day. Barely able to stand, he confronted the old couple. He howled in anger, he screamed accusations, he boasted about his noble birth, his wealthy family, and all of the important people that he knew. He described his brave deeds in war, and he spoke of many commendations. He repeated his own name and titles over and over again, desperate to impress them with his importance. He threatened them, he swore at them, he swore they would be punished for their betrayals. And then, finally powerless and unable to speak anymore, the captain fell at the old man's feet. He had nothing else to claim and no will left to fight. The shaman's wife stood by her husband's side. Seeing the once proud man curled up in the dirt, she wanted to leave. The shaman said nothing. He took a deep breath and he walked away. As he walked, a smile formed on his lips, for true transformation had begun. The captain, so proud and so blind, was now ready to become the wise and selfless man that he desired. Having surrendered his illusions, he was ready to yield to the will of life. Goosebumps. Again, goosebumps, yes. Um, <clears throat> and so that really makes me think the part of the story of, you know, when he goes off and he's going to get a fine, I'm just, just going to go back to my, my mission and he's running all around and he's getting reckless and swimming and he can't get his bearings, even though he had been living in this jungle for a long time. He somehow um, can't find his way and is lost. That's just really. Um, really powerful to me about our own story that sometimes we're just running around in circles. Um, and then we realize, oh, I'm right back where I started. I, the same stuff just keeps coming up, <laughs> right? Yeah, Don? This reminds me of a story that uh, I and saw. We're gonna have to cut yep. real quick here. Yep. This reminds me of a story I saw that it was a, a uh, I guess it was a Buddhist monk and, and a, his his uh, his student came in one day and and was one, wanted to know the answers to to uh, some questions and and the the old man uh, started pouring tea and he just poured the tea in, and and he just poured it until it was running over and 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 the boy grabbed it from me and he said what are you doing he said there's nothing I can tell you you're so full. There's nothing, there's nothing you can receive from me. Because he was so anxious and so um, upset by what was going on, there was, there was no wisdom he could give him because it was, it, there was no place to put it. <laughs> oh, that's good. So one final story about love. And this, um, <clears throat> this is kind of, um, kind of sums up all of the material um, in this book. So imagine that you have a full pantry of food always. No matter how much you eat, no matter how much you feed your family or how extravagantly you treat your friends, you always have food in your pantry. That would be great, right? Now, let's say that someone comes to your door with baskets full of exotic foods. This person offers you a basket just like it every day if. If what? Well, if you let them take charge of your life, if you let them abuse you or disrespect you, if you make them the center of your world, if you do all of that, then you can enjoy the free food. You laugh at the idea. Come on, your pantry is always full of good stuff. 
to think that you compromise your happiness and self-esteem because someone felt they could take advantage of your hunger? What a joke. Except wait. What if you were actually hungry and you didn't know where your next meal was coming from? People all over the planet live like that. It could happen to any of us. If you were starving and someone arrived at your door with the promise of food every day, you'd probably accept it under their terms. You'd fall under the person's control and you'd never have the courage to walk away. You might even be grateful for their abuses. When your life is filled with love, love with no conditions or limitations, who can bargain for your heart? No one. No one can take advantage of you because you have plenty of love to spare. When you don't feel a desperate hunger to be adored or appreciated, no one can put you in a position of feeling grateful for their cruelty. So how do you keep your own pantry full? You are love in action. You can't be dying for love because you are the source of love. You don't have to wait for love or hope for love. Love comes directly from you. Thank you.